Welcome back to another episode of the Cody podcast, where we get into the nitty gritty of data science, statistics, and how these concepts shape the way we understand the world. I'm your host, and today we're diving deep into one of the most fascinating and essential areas in statistics, causal inference. It's a huge topic with so many moving parts, but I want to take you on a journey, one that starts with the basics and builds up to some really exciting advanced concepts. So grab your favorite drink, find a cozy spot, and let's talk about everything from confounders to causal graphs to the magic of counterfactuals. All right, so let's start from the beginning. Confounders. Imagine you're trying to figure out if drinking coffee every morning makes people more productive. Seems straightforward, right? You collect some data, you see a trend. People who drink coffee seem to be more productive. But here's the thing there could be something else going on. Maybe the people who drink coffee also tend to be early risers, or maybe they're the kind of folks who hit the gym before work, giving them an energy boost. Those habits, waking up early, exercising, are confounders. They're variables that could be influencing both the coffee drinking and the productivity. If you don't account for these confounders, you might wrongly attribute all the productivity benefits to the coffee, when in reality, It's this whole package of behaviors working together. Confounders are the sneaky little details that can throw off your entire analysis if you're not careful. And trust me, they're everywhere. Now this brings us to something closely related, selection bias. Think about it. If you only choose to study people who are already motivated enough to wake up early and exercise, and then you look at their coffee drinking habits, you're not really getting a full picture of the average person's behavior or outcomes. It's like you're stacking the deck in favor of your hypothesis without even meaning to. Let's say you're evaluating a new online course that promises to teach people coding skills. If you only look at the people who complete the course and ignore those who dropped out, you're missing a whole chunk of relevant data. Maybe the people who finished the course were already motivated and tech savvy, and that's why they succeeded. If you don't consider the dropouts, your study has selection bias. You're selecting based on a factor, motivation or tech skills, that's directly related to the outcome. This is a huge deal in causal inference because it can totally mislead you about the true effect of a treatment, intervention or variable. So how do we try to get around these tricky issues like confounders and selection bias? Enter A-B testing and randomized controlled trials or RCTS. If you've ever heard of a clinical trial for a new drug, you're already familiar with this concept. The idea is to randomly assign participants to two groups, one that gets the treatment, like a new medication or marketing campaign, and one that doesn't. This way, the only difference between the two groups is the treatment itself. Everything else, like age, gender, pre-existing conditions, or in the marketing world, customer demographics, is spread out evenly across the groups. It's this randomization that's key. It helps us make sure that the groups are as similar as possible so that when we compare outcomes, we can say with a lot more confidence that any difference we see is due to the treatment itself and not some hidden confounder. Now you might be thinking, great, let's just do A, B test for everything. And honestly, I get the enthusiasm. A, B tests are powerful. But here's the thing, they're not always possible. Sometimes it's just not practical or ethical to randomly assign people to different conditions. Imagine trying to run an experiment on whether smoking causes lung cancer. You can't exactly assign people to a smoking group and a non-smoking group. It's unethical and obviously harmful. So what do you do in those situations where you can't run an RCT? This is where causal inference becomes an art as much as a science. We will get back to the podcast in just a second. This is just a note from me that if you want to learn how to get hands on with data, you can find courses on Python, Apache Spark and more at cody.co.uk. Let's shift gears a bit and talk about counterfactuals, one of the coolest concepts in causal inference. The counterfactual is basically the what if scenario. What if you hadn't had that cup of coffee this morning? Would your productivity still be the same? The challenge in real life is that we don't have a parallel universe to see what would have happened. We only see what actually happened. You drank the coffee and then you either were or weren't productive. But in order to really understand causality, we need to estimate 
what that other version of you, let's call it the counterfactual you, would have done if they didn't drink the coffee. That's the essence of counterfactual thinking. It's imagining the alternate reality where everything is the same, except for that one key variable. Now, creating these counterfactuals in real life, especially in large scale studies, can be incredibly tricky. This is where machine learning and matching techniques come into play. You might use matching algorithms to find people in your data set who are as similar as possible in every way, except for that one variable. Maybe you match people based on age, gender, income level, and work habits, and then look at how their coffee consumption affects their productivity. In a way, you're building a synthetic version of what that counterfactual world might look like using data from real people. Machine learning models are really useful here because they can process huge amounts of data to find those matches and predict outcomes based on patterns they've seen in similar cases. It's a bit like creating a twin in your data set to compare against, even if you can't do it perfectly. Speaking of building models and structures, let's talk about causal graphs and DAGs directed acyclic graphs. These are like roadmaps for understanding causality. Imagine you're looking at a diagram with nodes representing different variables and arrows pointing from one node to another, indicating influence. So if smoking leads to lung cancer, you'd have an arrow from smoking to lung cancer. But what if there's also a genetic factor involved, one that makes someone both more likely to smoke and more susceptible to lung cancer? You'd include that variable and draw arrows to both smoking and lung cancer to show that connection. What's powerful about these graphs is that they give you a visual representation of how everything in your model is connected. It helps you see which variables might be confounders or mediators and which paths you need to block in order to isolate the causal effect you care about. These graphs aren't just a visual aid. They're tools that guide the statistical models you'll use. If you can figure out the right structure, you can use it to test your assumptions and run more accurate analyses. And the cool part, DAGs can show you where you might need to collect more data or control for additional variables to make your conclusions stronger. It's like having a cheat sheet that tells you, hey, don't forget about this factor when you're running your model. Now, let's dig into something called SUTVA, the Stable Unit Treatment Value Assumption. I know it sounds like a mouthful, but it's really a simple idea at its core. It's the assumption that what happens to one person in your experiment doesn't influence what happens to another. Imagine you're testing a new drug and you've got your two groups, one getting the drug and one getting a placebo. SUTVA would mean that the outcomes of people in group A who get the drug shouldn't affect the outcomes of people in group B who don't. In a real world setting, it might get a little complicated though. Let's say group A starts experiencing a lot of side effects and group B hears about it. Suddenly their behavior or perception might change even though they're not getting the drug themselves. If that happens, your groups aren't truly independent and SUTVA is violated. This independence is crucial for your results to be reliable because if there's interference between groups, you can't be sure if the effect you're seeing is due to the treatment itself or the information flow between groups. All right, so we've covered a lot of ground. Now let's get into ignorability, another core idea in causal inference. This one's all about the assumption that once we've controlled for all the relevant variables, we can ignore any further potential confounders. In other words, if we believe we've accounted for everything that could possibly influence the treatment and outcome, we can treat the assignment of treatment as if it were random. This is huge because if it holds true, it allows us to estimate causal effects much more confidently. It's like saying, okay, we know there are no hidden surprises lurking in our data, so we can trust that the relationship we're seeing is genuine. Of course, in practice, it's really tough to be sure that you've measured everything that matters. There's always a bit of uncertainty. What if there's a variable you didn't think to include? Or what if you couldn't measure something accurately? That's why ignorability is a critical but challenging assumption. It's something you strive for, but you always have to be cautious and acknowledge that there's a margin of error. And that leads us perfectly into talking about ATE and Kate. The average treatment effect and conditional 
average treatment effect. The ATE is sort of like the headline number when you're evaluating the impact of a treatment. What's the overall effect on average? But the reality is effects often vary. Think about a new educational program. You implement it and find that on average, it improves test scores. But maybe when you look closer, you see that the improvement is much higher for students who already had some background knowledge, while it had little effect on those starting from scratch. That's where CATE comes in. It's the average effect for a particular group or under specific conditions. Knowing the CATE helps you understand the heterogeneity of your treatment's impact. It's not just does it work, but for whom does it work best and under what circumstances. This deeper level of insight is crucial, especially in policymaking or personalized medicine, where the goal is to tailor interventions to the right people. So there you have it, a journey through causal inference from confounders to counterfactuals to causal graphs. Each concept builds on the next, like puzzle pieces that fit together to help us get as close as possible to understanding cause and effect. It's a challenging field, no doubt, but it's also incredibly powerful and insightful. Thanks for sticking with me through this deep dive. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe and share it with someone who loves getting nerdy about data as much as we do. Until next time, stay curious and keep digging into the data.